We became friends my freshman year. We went to the same church, played for the same high school basketball team. And probably for since then, there wasn't a month that has gone by that we haven't been in touch with each other. When I was in college, I came back and visited with him. And as time went on between him and my parents, they were the only really friends I had in my hometown. Um, we kept in touch with each other. And about six and a half years ago, he was diagnosed with cancer. I knew that was a struggle. So month after month, he always reported uh, about his latest uh, health report, and I, I took interest in that. And then in October, he told me the doctor said there's nothing more that could be done. So coming back to visit my parents, always visit with him. And I knew in late November that would be the last time I saw him. And then December 2nd, his younger brother called me that he died. How often I wish I could go back to the days that when I go back to see my parents in my hometown, that he would be there. I wish I could go back to the days when he was there and I could visit with him. I wish that it wasn't him who died. I wish I could go back to those days. Is there something that you wish for that you could go back to? Maybe the days when that person said they still love me. Maybe I wish for the day that that person was still alive. I wish for the day that I still had that job and that income. Is there something in your life that you wish you'd go back to how things were the way before? A friendship, a loved one, a family member still with you, a job, whatever. Wish that you could go back to how it was before. Isn't that what a crisis is? If I could just go back to how it was before? I, I think that's how Jairus felt. Jairus' daughter was 12 years old and she was very ill. And he said, I just wish to go back to how it was before. My little 12-year-old girl could do what 12-year-old girls do, you know, help out in the kitchen, hang out with their girlfriends, talk about boys, go to the temple, go to the synagogue, enjoy life. Instead, she was stricken with a disease. And so Jairus did the only thing he know, knew to do. He went to see Jesus, and when he's talking to Jesus, someone came up to him and said, your daughter is now dead. How Jairus wished that he could go back to how life was before. Much like my friend, I just wish I'd go back that my little 12-year-old girl was healthy and in the kitchen helping mom or playing with her friends. Now, I think you know how that works out. Jesus went there. Both wishing how things were before in my life or your life echoes about the reality of evil. What's the worst evil in our world? Now, I'm not asking you to throw it out to me. What's the worst evil in our world? Is it school shootings? Was it the Holocaust? Is the worst evil in our world the fear that one day our leaders might send us into nuclear oblivion, just blow up the whole world? Is the worst evil that we see the idolatry, the lack of respect of authority? What's the worst evil in our world? Slavery? The sex slave trade? What's the worst evil in our world? Diseases that we can't cure? Greed, neglect of God and neighbor? What's the worst evil in our world? If I'd ask you, what'd you say? Knives, guns, war, evil. Harold Kushner wrote a best-selling book called Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And in his mind, he answers the question of evil. He logically assesses why is there evil, and this is what he said. Either God is either all-loving but not all-powerful, or God is all-powerful but not all-loving, because an all-loving, all-powerful God wouldn't allow evil to take place. Either God is all-powerful or all-loving because an all-powerful, all-loving God wouldn't allow evil to take place. When I was in high school, I had a really good friend, and they knew I was going to the church work, and his father always told me, I don't believe in God, because if there is a God, God would not have allowed the Holocaust to take place. Where was God when six million Jews were herded off to concentration camps and killed? And that's why I don't believe in God. And maybe you had conversation with friends who say, you know what, I stopped believing in God after my child got killed. After my uncle died of that terrible disease, I no longer believed in God. How could God allow my husband or my wife to leave me and I don't believe in your God? If he's all loving and all powerful, he must be doing a terrible job. And so Harold Kushner, he doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe in the God that we believe in because God is either all-powerful or all-loving, but he can't be both because he'd put an end to the world. And so the question of evil is still among us. 
Matter of fact, I believe one of the reasons our pews are so empty is because people say, I don't believe in your God. If your God really loved me, my mom wouldn't have died. If your God really loved me, my spouse would still be with me. If, you, if your God really loved me, my boss wouldn't have dumped me. The question of evil. Well, to answer that, I'm going to take you back to the beginning. Back to Genesis 1 and 2. And the Bible said, and God made the world and everything was what? Ten times God said, I made the world and everything in it. I separated the firmaments. I separated land from water. I separated the skies and the heavens, and I populated them. And every time God said, he said he made it how? Good. I made the world good. It was perfect. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. And in that world, God created Adam and Eve in his image. I asked that to couples that I marry, my couple and my counseling. Was it we made to be in the image of God? And they look at me. Well, was it made to be in the image of God? We're made in the image of God. What does that mean? Do we look like God? No, to be made in the image of God is that God gave us a brain, a soul, a heart, reason, ability to have rationality, to think, to feel, to be in relationship, to know right and wrong, and to know God. We are made in his image, and inside of us, God put in his characteristics, and God didn't make brutes. We had a free will. And God made it all good, and when God brought Eve to Adam, Adam said, wow! She is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. Wow! It was a good life. They enjoyed God. God walked among them. He gave them marriage and to procreate. And I, I, I share this every service. I'll share it with you. My wife and I, we procreated. We didn't reproduce. There's not three little Kurtz and three little Lisas, all right? We don't reproduce. We what? Procreate. And God put Adam and Eve in the garden, and it was perfect, and it was good, and something bad happened. What? Somebody really wise came in, and you know this, assisted in ruling that world. Someone threw out a lure that they couldn't resist. And you know what the lure is? It's the all-time best temptation. You get to call the shots. You get to do things your way. You get to be your own master, your own God. I'm the master of my life. The tempter gave us the Frank Sinatra disease. What's that? I did it how? My way. Billy Joel says this, go ahead with your own life, leave me alone. I do things how? My way. If you don't like it, leave. I'm my boss. And that lure was too great. It's the exact opposite of love the Lord your God. The exact opposite of you shall have no other gods. And that lure, I do my own thing, leave me alone, that was too great. And so what happened? Well, Adam, Eve, push, pulled, persuaded. The sin wasn't they ate the fruit. Now, I don't know if it's an apple. The sin was what happened in their heart. They listened to the tempter and not to God, and that's when evil came in. There was a mom, and she baked this wonderful chocolate cake, and she put icing on it, and her son was there watching it, and she said, now, you're not going to touch that chocolate cake until after supper. I need to do some stuff outside for 20 minutes, but you don't touch the cake. Matter of fact, you go in the other room, and you leave the what? The cake alone. So mom went outside for 20 minutes, and guess what happened? Came in, the boy had chocolate crumbs all over himself. Said, what happened? I told you not to touch the, the cake. And the boy said, well, the devil just pulled me in, okay? Adam and Eve, I just got pulled into this. I got, I got drug in. I got pushed in. I got persuaded. And they bought into that lie. They who had a free will made the image of God, and it has its consequences. Sin has consequences, Sinning against a holy and just God has a consequences. Just like when you and I speed or we don't pay our taxes, there's what? Consequences, right? That's reality. So God said, Adam and Eve, where are you? Well, God knows where you are. If you want to play hide-and-go-seek with God, you're going to lose every time, right? You can't play hide-and-go-seek with God. He's going to know where you're at. See, God knew where he was. They were. God's saying, tell me about the condition of your heart. Tell me about who I am and who you are, because right now it's not good. See, what happens is when we get confronted with sin, we make excuses, right? So they hide, they close themselves, they blame. God, the woman you gave me, no, that person did it, right? After early service, someone said, whenever you point at someone, three fingers are pointing where? Back at you. They wish it could go back like it was before. They knew they were, they were naked. There was lust. 
There was shame. There was covering themselves. I wish he could go back, but sin has its consequences. You know how I knew there was sin in the world? Because of this. You heard it before. To err is human, to forgive what? To err is human and to blame someone else when I err is even more what? Adam and Eve. It's for the person's fault. And sin has its consequences. God is holy and just. Where are you? It separates. It tears. It's a reality. You sin against a holy and just God, there's consequences to that. We know about consequences. You're familiar with this. Don't do the crime if you don't, can't do the what? Yeah? You reap what you what? Sin has its consequences. If you mess with a bull, you get the... I had a high school teacher sell it to us, okay? What else? Well, give them a taste of their own what? Yeah, sin has its consequences. You made the bed, now what? Yeah, sin has its consequences. Or, some people create their own storms and complain when it what? Rains. Adam and Eve sinned against God with a free will, made in the image of God, and sin has its consequences. I think you heard that before in the children's message that, that was mentioned. Let's talk about that sin that we have. Can you read the verse in red? For all. All, that's us. This is what Jesus said. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within out of a person's heart that what? We inherited that sin and that corruption. We inherited that guilt. There's consequences. This is what David says. Surely I was sinful from my birth the time my mother what? Conceived me. We call that original sin. Some people who say I don't believe in original sin. If you don't believe in original sin, go visit a preschool. Okay? Go visit a preschool and there's no teachers if you don't believe in original sin. A pastor once told me that his three and four-year-olds reminded him what original sin was. I was one time walking by a nursery and probably the leader stepped out. There's a little boy, had a little toy truck, and he's banging the other boy in the head with it. Bang, bang, bang. There are boys crying, he's screaming, just wouldn't stop. So I took the truck away from him and I banged him on the head. No, I didn't do that, all right? I, they didn't know any difference. Hey, if you don't believe in original sin, then let's do this. Raise your child until the age of 10 and never tell them the word no. Give them whatever they want. Then send them to your teacher. How'd that work out? Nobody has to teach you and I how to sin. That's our nature. It comes naturally. That's original sin. We inherited what Adam and Eve have, for all have sinned. And most painfully, from Adam came death to who? All. Today is simply another day closer to our death. I was in a hospital room visiting with a member, and the surgeon came in, and they were talking about life and things, and the surgeon said this, he says, none of us get out of here alive. None of us leave this world how? Alive. Why? What Adam and Eve did brought sin and death to all, to you and I. See, my rebuttal to Harold Kushner is this. Read it. Yeah, you ever hear a person say, I just want to get what I deserve? So I recommend this prayer. Dear God, give me what I deserve. What do you think? Anyone want to do that tonight? Hey, God, give me, do you really want God to give you what you deserve? No. If God gives what we deserve, it'd be really bad. We're all born into sin. Sin is a reality. It's a consequence of sinning against the holy and just God. God does not tolerate sin, and evil's a consequence of that. It has its punishments. That's why there's evil. That's why we say we wish I could go back to how it was before. And no offense, with all love, some people can't wrap their heads around it. Some people block the Holy Spirit from allowing them to grasp it. Why is there sin and death and evil? Because Adam and Eve, in a perfect state, sinned against God, and there is punishment for sin. That's how we explain or try to explain evil. Good and evil, that question. Um, I got the title for this sermon when I was in, I was just thinking back when I was in grad school in Missouri, and I took a class called Advanced Adolescent Psychology. You know, there really is a class called Advanced Adolescent Psychology, 
and we try to figure out why teenagers act the way they do. Now, don't be wrong, I love teenagers, right? You know, but there's a class that tries to figure out why, how teenagers act the way they do. Well, Samuel Clemens said this, when my son turned 16, I stuck him in a barrel, and I put a hole in it to feed him. When he turned 18, I put him in a barrel, and I put a cork in the hole, okay? Right? That's teenagers, right? But I took a class called Advanced Adolescent Psychology, and um, we all had to give reports about a facet of teenagers' life. And my report was over music, how it affects teenagers. But in my class, about two-thirds of my classmates on their own said, there's something really wrong with this world. You know, teenagers tend to be idealistic. There's something really wrong in our world. Well, guess what's wrong? It's a three-letter word called what? Sin. That's what's wrong with our world. So to that, there are, um, where are you? Once again, God's asking Adam and Eve, where are you with all this? So there's four realities, and I want us to view the world like this. The first reality is we still see good in God's creation. Jan brought that out. There's still beauty in the world. What's the most beautiful thing you've seen? My wife and I, we've been to Alaska. That's beautiful. I think America's view is the Grand Tetons. You need to go see the Grand Tetons in the various angles. That, that's, to me, the most beautiful thing I've seen. What's the most beautiful thing you've seen? Because there's still what? Good in God's creation. A newborn, right? A wedding. There's still good in God's creation. Second of all, is we see evil in every part of this world. Um, last April, alarm went off, and I said it might be the fire drill, but I don't, I'm not going to go out. I have stuff to do. If it gets bad, I'll just climb out the window. That's just me. And the secretaries came and got me and said, no, this is a shooter's drill. I said, what? Well, in case a shooter comes into our school, we have a place we have to go hide. So we went in the other office, and we were hiding in the corner. There's evil in every part of our world. A few years ago, I took my kids to, to Disney World, and we're riding on Peter Pan's flight, and we got off it, and we were getting off it, and we turned around. There's a little boy behind, behind us. He's in, the, he's in the, the cart behind us, and he had a big smile on his face, and you could tell he just wasn't well. And he was wearing a T-shirt that said, Make a Wish, what? Foundation. Even at Disney World, there is the presence of sickness, disease, and evil. It's everywhere. It's permeate all our life. It's in our church. It's in our home. It's in our community. We live with evil all the time. God made, there's still good in creation. There is still evil in the world. And you and I, we live in this dual world. Like what? God's judgment and God's grace. So every pestilence, the coronavirus, tornadoes, floods, earthquakes, wars, are a reminder, judgment day is coming. The world is messed up. Everything that happens like that's a reminder, judgment day is coming. That's what that's about. God's reminding us. A flood, a famine, a hurricane, tornado, my judgment is coming. Martin Luther said, I have two days in my calendar, today and judgment day. Don't know when that is. So God's judgment is still upon this world. Evil people are still punished. But yet we see God's grace in the world. Like how? Well, one, one, of our, one of our classes at our school goes to a nursing home and visits people there. That's God's grace. When you go visit somebody in the hospital, that's what? God's grace. When you encourage someone who's heartbroken, that's what? That's God's grace. We see God's grace in the world in our food pantry. We see God's grace in our world with, with, with our clothes closet. We live with a dual reality of God's judgment and yet at the same time God's grace. And why does today exist? Someone's coming to faith. Why does this week exist? Because there's going to be somebody new in our church who wants to join. It's true. We live in a dual reality of God's judgment and God's grace every single day. And finally, finally, God sent Jesus to forgive and redeem this world and sent us to spread it. To my friend who said, my friend said, said, I don't believe in God of the Holocaust. Jesus died for our sins. How come my loved one died in a car crash? Jesus died for you. How come there's a coronavirus? Jesus died for everybody. That's our response. Jesus came into the world to redeem and to forgive. That's where we point. If you have a grievance, Jesus died for you. Somebody left me, Jesus died for you. That's God's cure. I love this picture. Can you read it? Life is short. Yeah, the boy got it. That's Genesis. How I wish things were before. Yeah, death is sure sin the cause. Christ
Christ redeemed it. What a blessing that is. I wish things were the way we were before, but I know I'll see my friend in heaven. I know God will right all wrongs. God will bring an end to evil and bring us to his eternal paradise. So I'll this for a closing thought. Luther's hymn, All Mankind Fell in Adam's Fall. All mankind fell in Adam's fall. One common sin infects them all. From sire to son, the bane descends, and over all its curse impends. We thank thee, Christ, new life is ours, new light, new hope, new strength, new powers. May grace our every way attend until we reach our journey's end. And all God's people say...